so welcome to this third day of the workshop. Uh, and I don't think it appeared like, as such in the final program, but during the organization of the workshop, there were two main uh, subjects that we thought should be discussed. This uh, so-called generalized Ikeda uh, clustering that uh, so most of the talks of the first two days were about this first subject and then also there was some interest in the study of the case in the continuum and with the with the new developments in experiments the access to particle correlations in both theory and experiment uh, and then so in principle these two last days of the workshop are focus on this second point, but as you saw yesterday, the two are quite uh, connected. So the only thing before starting the session, the only thing I tried to do was just a reminder of the topics that have been discussed yesterday, the, the first two days, Monday and Tuesday. So we started with general talks about threshold phenomena that set this this uh, this problem in a very general in a very general uh, frame uh, because as soon as we reach a threshold uh, independently of the particle content of the threshold then we, we we may favor or we may observe this this correlated structures and then we had talks about, in particular, the, the most famous structure, the Hoyle state, and also about the Efimov character of this state and other possible candidates in nuclear physics, and several talks about alpha clustering and condensation. So either in, in this Hoyle state or in thin isotopes, beryllium isotopes, and uh, Martin showed yesterday even seven alpha particle chains. And then we had also some theoretical talks about the effective interactions that are used in these models between the two alpha particles, some of them derived from, from LATI CFT. We also have seen talks about two proton states and also the beta delay proton emission in, in beryllium 11. And finally, some experiments about correlations at the proton drip line, in which uh, we saw uh, two proton correlations, but also in uh, Bob's talk yesterday, more three, four protons, and also several alpha particles. And so in, in the discussions, one of the points that were high, uh, right, raised were we we do see these exotic structures so diproton or cigar or triangular uh, or linear chains in carbon uh, these structures are orig originated from 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 the interactions and then we observe the decay of these states and there are some certain decay dynamics so sequential direct for the whole state but also for the others and of course, the question is, are these dynamics of the decay connected to the exoticity of the structures or are they governed by the interactions in the decay? And this is something was, that was discussed yesterday and I think, I hope it will be still discussed today after the session. And then today, so these are the talks of today's uh, session. Uh, we will start with uh, this, this talk about two nucleon decay, that it will be, in fact, uh, dealing with two proton decay. So we hope that this first talk by one will shed some light of the latest talks of, the, of, of yesterday. Uh, but what can we learn from these uh, correlations in, in, in two proton decay? Then we will move to a talk about exotic nuclear decays. So it will be mainly about the Hoyle state 
and exper experimental results in which is the state has been populated by beta decay, but also searching for a rare gamma decay. Then we will have a break. Uh, and in the second part of the session, we will see again a talk about uh, prot one or two proton emission. So in the same line of yesterday's talks. On the, on the first observation of magnesium-18 uh, on experiments at uh, NSCL. And then we will start with the neutral part of the workshop. So a talk about the neutron neutron scattering length. So this is a new and exciting project that aims to, to, to measure. So you know that the neutron neutron scattering length there is some controversy because depending on the on the pion capture experiments or on the deuteron breakup experiments, there is some discrepancy between the values. And this is a, a, a new suggestion to measure this parameter at very high energy. So very high neutron energy, but very small relative neutron energy. So this is a proposal that is led by Tom Auman at Riken to break helium-6 into uh, at, at hundreds of MeV per nucleon, but detecting the two neutrons at very low relative energy. So in this way, we avoid the problems related to the neutron efficiency at low neutron energies. And we will see this will be a, the theoretical view of this project. And then we will end today's session with uh, two theoretical talks, two, or two more theoretical talks. One of them about something we discussed today, the quenching of spectroscopic factors with the increasing neutron content and the link of this. So you see here EE prime proton on calcium 40 and calcium 48, the link of this effect with the short range correlations. And this will, do, this will be done with the dispersive optical model. And finally, another thing we discussed a bit yesterday, the, the influence of the nuclear structure, uh, of the direct reactions on the nuclear structure. So some of these states that we are observing are unbound and decay, others are uh, come from breakup or from knockout of nucleons. And in this last talk, we will see the effect with halo EFT, uh, the effect of, of, of the one neutron knockout on the, on the information about nuclear structure. And then tomorrow, we will move completely to the neutron side. We will start with uh, a talk about the latest results at Samurai concerning the oxygen isotope, so 26 and also 27 and 28, and other experiments related to the dineutron correlations. Then we will move to an experiment probing beryllium-16 uh, and the experimental correlations for the first time. And next to that, there will be a theoretical talk that will be connected to the, to the previous one because uh, Casal will show a three body model trying to, to describe the, the, the correlations in the structure of beryllium-16, but also in the decay of beryllium-16. And that will be connected to the first talk of today, of uh, one. Then we will see another talk about strongly correlated pairs, but this time induced by deeply bound nuclear knockout. So different probe, but similar signal. We will then see two talks about the ab initial description of reactions and clustering. So starting from the nuclear nucleon interaction. And the last talk of the workshop will be a theoretical view with HALO EFT of beta delay proton emission from beryllium 11. So the thing, the, the talk that was presented by Ayad yesterday, then we will see the, the, the theoretical view. And 
so we we will have time to discuss uh, at the end of today's session and also at the end of tomorrow's session and just yes, maybe something that will change tomorrow is that we will be we will remove the coulomb interaction from the game so this may this may have some effect on the on the discussion uh, so i will now we start the first part of the session with the first two talks by Wang and Fimbo. I will chair this session and then Hans will chair the, the second part of the session uh, after the break. So if the first speaker is ready, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and he can start with his presentation on dynamics and correlations of, of two nucleon decay. So can everyone see my slide and uh, hear my voice? Yes. Okay. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So thank you very much for the inviting me to uh, give a talk in such a nice workshop. So my talk today is about the dynamics and the correlations of two nuclear decays, which has been nicely introduced by Bob in his yesterday's talk. And uh, today I will show my point of uh, my understanding for this program. So here is my inter, uh, outline. And first, I will briefly introduce the two proton decay phenomena. And uh, in order to study these problems, I, we developed uh, several models like a uh, so three body gamma of gamma channel method and the time dependent approach. And the key point of this work is uh, this talk is to answer this question, question, what we can we learn from the two proton decay, which also been shown in Bob's talk. And since these two proton emitters are uh, far away from the chip line and they are open quantum systems, so we expect some exotic structures and continue effect. And uh, this also been shown in Marik and uh, Vitek's talk. And we can also understand uh, some interplay between nuclear and the current interactions in these uh, two proton decays. So as the next generation facility being built and operating, there are many uh, GPI nuclei has been discovered. And uh, along them are many new phenomena. For example, when we go beyond the two-proton GPI, there are some nuclei where are emitted two protons. That's what we call the two-proton decay. So in principle, usually we require the mother, the ground state of the mother nuclei is have a higher energy than the daughter nuclei, but uh, lower than the neighboring nuclei. In this, uh, as a result, the one decay, one proton decay channel is strongly suppressed or energetically forbidden. So the idea of the two proton decay is relatively old. It was first uh, proposed by Godensky in 1916, but uh, the first directly measurement was in iron 45, like uh, 20 years ago. After that, there are many more the two proton emitters has been discovered. For example, like the ground state two proton emitter for in iron, for iron, nickel, uh, neon, and the brilliant, and, et cetera. And there are other cases, like uh, from the excited states of the nucleus and uh, also the beta delayed two proton decays. But these cases are uh, more complicated and uh, it's hard to tell whether it's a true two proton decay or a sequential decay. So theoretically, there, there are many candidates. Uh, uh, for the two proton decays. For example, Eric using density functional theory to search the candidates for two proton decay near the trip lines. So they found, he found that uh, uh, beyond the trip line, there are a lot of uh, two proton candidates, which remains undiscovered compared to those uh, already measured uh, two proton emitters. And further, uh, more, Leo was using uncertainty quantifications, which is uh, the Gaussian process uh, of the machine learning to determine those possibilities of the two proton emitters. And we can see that uh, uh, below the tin isotopes, there are quite a few uh, nucleus, nucleus that has uh, uh, possibilities larger than 15%. So on the other hand, the interest of the two proton decay has also been boosted by the measurement of the nuclear nuclear correlations. For example, in iron 45, 
the matter the, the two proton correlations and this can reveal some uh, structural information. For example, they can see those peak wave components in the iron 45. And uh, also there are a lot of more correlations being measured in the light nuclei, like uh, the S, uh, 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 PCR nuclei brain 6 and the SD shell nuclei oxygen and the neon 16, which has been introduced by Bob in his yesterday's talk. So we can see that uh, from system to system, some, some of these systems shows us very similar nuclear correlations, and some of them are quite different. So this will reveal some unique features of those uh, nuclei. So for, for example, uh, two, uh, two proton emitters were emitted uh, two protons, and uh, they can be detected uh, by the experiment in a far away distance. And uh, meanwhile, experimentally, they can also measure the parent correlation, which is uh, the energy and the angular correlations of the emitted two protons, which uh, is like a fingerprint. They can reveal some structures or other information of the nucleus. So how can we decipher these uh, parent correlations and uh, to obtain, obtain those information, this requires a self-consistent model and a precise numer numerical method. This is also the purpose of our works. So we want to develop some kind of uh, self-consistent models to extract those structural information and continue effect, and also understand those uh, interpret between the nuclear and the current interactions. So for now, there are several theoretical approaches in the market like the simplified models, which treated the two protons as a pair and decay as a cluster. And since they have uh, some assumptions, so this decay width is, uh, the uncertainty of the decay width is relatively large. And later on, Greg Rankle developed his uh, three body models, which is uh, written in Jacobi, -Y co uh, Jacobi coordinate, like the right-hand side shows. In this uh, uh, coordinate, they can give the uh, correct uh, symptotic three body behaviors, and also show that uh, different configurations of, for the violent uh, protons. But uh, uh, he chose the frozen core, which has no core excitations or it deformation included. Meanwhile, Jimmy was uh, uh, trying uh, to put a continuous in the shell model. So this is called the SMAC models, which has been introduced by Marek and uh, Vitek yesterday. So in this uh, uh, models, they can consider the configuration mixing and the continuous effect. But they, are, but they are defined in the shell model framework, which is a lab coordinate. And there are several other methods like CDCC R matrix or molecular dynamics, which uh, they are all focused on different aspects uh, of the decaying systems. So in order to understand the connections between the structures and the correlations, one may need to uh, describe these two aspects on the same footings. But uh, as we can see, those two aspects are usually in very different scales. So theoretically, they are usually treated in different ways. So the purpose of our work is trying to build a, a framework that can treat the structure and the decay on the same footings. So to this end, we developed the gamma of couple channel method. But for now, we still limited the uh, uh, focus on the three body systems. So we describe the system as a deformed core plus two valence uh, protons. And the Hamiltonian is the connected term plus uh, two body interactions. And in order to consider a uh, deformation of the core and the core excitations, we introduce the core Hamiltonians and then eliminate the center of mass motions. So as a result, the total wave function is uh, constructed by the valence protons and deformed cores. And we written this uh, wave function in Jacobi coordinate to eliminate the center of mass motions and get the proper asymptotic behaviors. Meanwhile, we also adopted the program basis techniques, which is also used in the gamma of shell model framework. So the program basis contains bound state, resonance, and scattering state. Basically, it considered all the possible uh, solutions for the decay systems. So it can treat the structure and decay information on the same footings. So what we want to do is uh, to use this uh, gamma of couple channel method to study those uh, stru nuclear structures and their impact on the decay properties and dynamics. So we apply, first we applied our models on the Krypton 67, which is a two proton emitter discovered recently. And experimentally, the measure the lifetime was like uh, 20 milliseconds, which is uh, far less than the previous theoretical predictions. So for example, 
Brad Anko used his three body models to give uh, estimations around 200 milliseconds. Meanwhile, the method like WKB method give a, more, a, a result with more discrepancy. And uh, according to the density functional theory studies, in these regions, those nucleus usually have oblate deformations. So this indicates that uh, there might be some deformations and configuration mixes in this uh, uh, systems, which might impact those decay process. So this is uh, just perfect for our models. So we used uh, our model to describe the system and uh, treat the selenium 65 at the core plus two valence protons. And uh, then calculate the decay lifetime or decay width as a function of, of uh, the deformations from the spherical to the oblate. So the uh, red line and the blue lines on the left hand side figures are our calculations. And the origin region is the experimental data. So at the beginning, when the system is spherical, our calculation gives a lifetime like a 200 millisecond, which is in accord with the previous uh, theoretical studies. And as the deformation keeps increase, the calculated lifetime actually become larger, which makes uh, it uh, even farther from the experimental data. So uh, how could do we understand this? We can see it from the right-hand side, the Nielsen orbitals. So when the system is spherical, the Fermi surface is strong here, which means that uh, the valence protons are mainly occupied the P wave and the F wave. And since the P wave has a lower centrifugal barriers, it will uh, benefit for the decay process. So the valence protons are mainly decay through the P wave. But as the deformation keeps increasing, this uh, the energy of this P1 half wave uh, become larger and larger, which makes the harder for the valence protons to occupy. And uh, as a result, this uh, decay lifetimes become larger. And when the de deformation keeps increasing, there are some structure changes. For example, there is a new shell, new subshell, T equal to 36 forms. And uh, also the P3 half orbitals uh, become above the Fermi surface. As a result, this uh, allows the protons can decay through the P wave again, which dramatically reduce this decay lifetimes. So the, as a result, our calculated uh, decay lifetime is in accord with the experiment to values. So we believe that uh, the short lifetime of the krypton 67 is caused by the structure changes and uh, make the low L orbitals uh, available for the decay process. Meanwhile, we're also trying to study those decay mechanisms in krypton 67. So we calculated the angular distributions for the valence protons inside the nucleus. So inside the nucleus, we found that most of the valence protons are formed pair. This means that they probably will form a Cooper pair and this will also benefit for the tunneling process. So we, uh, we solved the decay lifetime puzzles of Krypton 67. But in order to understand those decay process uh, most, uh, in more details and understand those uh, continuing effects therein, we tried to develop the time dependent approach, which basically is acting those time evolution operators on a wave, on a wave functions. So, and uh, exam those configuration evolutions from time to time. So in order to get the whole pictures of the decay process, we try to describe those wave functions in a large, large scales. To obtain those uh, precise wave functions, we use the trapping shelf polynomial expansions and uh, have the proper asymptotic behaviors. Meanwhile, we also take advantage of the gamma of couple channel wave functions and include those configuration mixings so that we can examine those uh, structural changes during the decay process. So as the first step, we try to describe those, uh, the proton decay from the brain six, since usually we believe the brain six has a relatively simple structure. It can be treated as a alpha core plus two valence protons. But the decay mechanisms for brain six is uh, rather complicated. So as we can see that uh, the neighboring nuclear of brain six is less than five, it has a very broad uh, resonance. And uh, then in principle, just uh, uh, brain six can decay 
through the pairs of the lithium-5 and uh, sequentially decay to the alpha core. So, but uh, in reality, there's no conclusion for the de decay mechanisms yet. So we call those uh, uh, mechanisms as the democratic decays. And in order to understand those uh, decay mechanisms of brain six, we first calculate the uh, structures of brain six as uh, shown in the right-hand side. The color contour is the density distributions in Jacobi coordinate. So the x-axis is the distance between two valence protons, and the y-axis is the distance between the alpha core and the proton pair. So as we can see, there are two peaks for the density distributions. So the right and left hand side of the peak correspond to the short distance between those valence protons, which means they have found a diproton structures. On the other hand side, the sigma like uh, peak is corresponding to the valence protons on the different side of the core. And those small arrows in the plot means the flux current, which indicates those uh, configuration evolutions inside the nucleus. As we can see, uh, inside the nucleus, the diproton structure and the sigma like structures, they are oscillating with each other. So when the valence protons are close to the origins, they tend to separate with each other due to the Coulomb repulsions and the Pauli principle. As a result, the diproton structure will evolve to the sigma like structure. But when they close to the surface, the sigma like structure will evolve to a diproton uh, structure and decay as a proton pair. So to understand the decay whole process, we for those density distributions in a large scales. So inside the 100 Fermis and evolve them uh, along the time. So this uh, four columns start and for the different steps of the decay process. So at the beginning, when the time is equal to zeros, most of the wave functions are inside the nucleus. And as the time evolves, there are two uh, branches emitted from the nucleus and the tunneling through the barriers. So the primary branch stands for the uh, diproton structures with uh, a small distance of the proton pair. And the other one is like uh, large angle emissions. So after tunneling the process, those uh, diproton structures tend to separate it because of, due to the Coulomb repulsions. And uh, as a result, those uh, diproton peak will bend towards those uh, sigma-like peaks. Finally, they will form the wide uh, broad uh, distributions, which is the correlations measured uh, by the experiments. So as we can see in the beginning, those correlations has two peaks and in the end, they form the broader pairs. This also means that uh, what we saw in experiments uh, is not exactly the information shared inside the nucleus. And uh, one may also curious that uh, what is the uh, large angle emissions stand for? Is it a sequential decay or simultaneous decay? To answer this question, we calculated the uh, density evolutions in Jacobi Y coordinate. So if the system is a sequential decay, that means uh, that uh, one of those valence protons will have small distance with the core, which means we would expect some densities along the Y axis or X axis. However, we saw that uh, as the time evolves, most of the valence protons will decay around the 45 degree of line, which means they have an equal distance from the core. And that means that almost uh, every proton pair in brain six is a simultaneous decay. And we can, uh, this is the uh, uh, density evolutions for the brain six. And we can also study some interesting aspects from the configuration evolutions, like the right, right hand side figure shows. So the right-hand side figure shows the configuration distributions in the momentum scheme. And uh, those blue line and the green line stands for the P wave components. And uh, those uh, red line is uh, the S wave components. And we can see most of those component configurations is the P wave components in the brain six because it's a P-shell nuclei. But uh, as the time evolves, we can see that uh, S wave components uh, become more and more important and they finally become dominated and uh, 
have almost 15% uh, of the total components. So how can we understand this? So this is also uh, the configuration evolutions, but in the 3D plot. And each size stands for the configuration distributions, and uh, they are evolving along the time. And uh, to understand those transitions from P wave to S wave, we can think about those decay dynamics, as we showed, that uh, most of the decay process are diproton decays. So in this case, they, have, they can describe the inter-Kirby coordinate with the configuration Lx equal to zero and Ly equal to zero. But uh, these uh, configurations can be also expanded in the single particle schemes, which corresponds to uh, different, uh, the mixing of different uh, orbit orbitals, like the SS wave and the PP wave and the DD wave, and etc. So this means that uh, the formation of the diproton structures actually form the bridge that uh, from different uh, uh, single particle levels. And uh, meanwhile, that the S orbitals uh, have a lower Coulomb barriers and uh, it will benefit for the decay process. So the valence proton is likely to decay through the S wave. But uh, however, that can never happen for the di uh, one proton emissions because due to the conservation of the angular momentum. Uh, but uh, when the, in two proton decay cases, since the diproton structure forms, it allows the transitions from the P wave to S wave. So in order to confirm these ideas, we also studied those uh, decay dynamics with different strengths of the pairing interactions. Since the pairing interaction directly connect to the formation of the diproton structures. And we uh, from the right, left hand side to the right hand side are the strong pairings to the weak pairings. And we found that as the time evolves, they show the very different decay dynamics. So from the right-hand side the figure is almost all the valence protons are decay as a proton pairs. On the other hand side, on the, when the pairing is weak, they are tend to emit it with, in large angles. So this will also result in a very different uh, asymptotic correlations. So as we calculated those energy correlation and angular correlations for brain six, which can be also measured in the experiments. So there are two types of angular correlations. Uh, the left-hand side is the Y-type con configurations, and the uh, other one is the T-type uh, angular correlations. And uh, usually people are brought those uh, EPP configuration uh, correlation with the T-type uh, correlations as a 2D correlations, as showed in uh, yesterday's talk, since it defined in a one Jacobi coordinate. But we found that if we are interested in the uh, pairing interaction or nuclear nuclear interactions, it actually sensitive to those uh, EPP correlations and the white type correlations. This can also be understood by the geometry of the Jacobi coordinates. And on the other hand side, this ECP correlation and the T-type correlation is more like uh, single particle features. So this also means that uh, we can uh, study those uh, experimental correlations and uh, find out those uh, uh, nuclear force informations for nuclear force and the stru structure informations. So the next thing is uh, to study a more realistic uh, uh, systems like the oxygen 12, which we compare those uh, uh, Jacobi correlations with uh, the experimental values. So as also shown in uh, yesterday's Bob's talk that uh, we found that uh, based on those correlations, there are more, a lot of more S wave components than the brain six. And this also means that uh, in this, inside the nucleus, the S wave components uh, in oxygen uh, 12 is larger than the brain six. And uh, meanwhile, we can also try to study some uh, uh, the interpret between coolant and nuclear interactions through the long range inter uh, correlations, which is the next step uh, project. And uh, so uh, the talk of uh, my talk is to trying to answer, uh, answer the question, what can we learn from the two problem decay? So for the structure aspects, we learned that uh, those exotic structures and the low air orbitals can might change the decay process. And for the continuing effect, we learned that uh, those continuing effects can form the diproton structure or clustering as shared in Marek and the Vitex talk. And it also make a bridge for the transition among the different orbitals. And we can also study those 
pairing interactions through the two-problem decay, since it strongly impacts the decay dynamics and it manifests itself in the asymptotic uh, EPP and Jacobi wide angular correlations. So for the perspectives, as uh, Bob mentioned uh, yesterday, there are uh, still uh, not uh, quite a lot of uh, correlations has been measured, especially for those uh, mid-heavy systems. So this also needs uh, further experimental or theoretical studies for these systems. Also, there are some uh, exotic uh, decay uh, cases like the carbon-8 or mechanism-18, which might have a 2P two two P plus 2P two P decay mechanisms, which you can see more in Jinyu's talk. So we can see that uh, uh, there are some difference between the mechanism 18 and the neon 16, to the correlations, which might indicate some structural difference in these two systems. And another aspect, uh, interesting aspect is the uh, two Newton decay, since it usually uh, uh, treated as the mirror process of the two proton decay. But since the two Newton decay, the lack of the current interactions, one may curious what is the symmetry and the unsymmetry between the two proton decay and the two Newton decay. So for now, there are several candidates for the two neutron decay, like the brilliant 16 and oxygen 26, and some decay from excited states, which I think uh, Baron and Adric will talk more about that. So we will also discuss this topic in the upcoming nuclear unbound system workshop. And uh, just, a just a little bit of spoiler, which regards to the Oliver's question yesterday, that uh, if we we change the two proton decay system to the two neutron decay system, whether we will uh, see a narrow peak in the small energy regions. So in order to understand this, uh, we artificially build a helium six with, by shifting his decay, his decay energies to one MeV. And uh, here's the result for the energy and angular correlations. As we can see that uh, those uh, current interactions actually have a dramatically impact on the angular correlations. However, they have less effect in the energy correlations. Uh, considering that uh, the, as we talked shows yesterday, that the proton-proton case, they have uh, the free proton-proton case, they have sharp structural resonance, which has a very large decay width. Uh, and uh, for the nuclear-nuclear case, they have an anti-bound state, which was very similar to the broader resonance and uh, strongly coupled to a broader range of continuing effect that we might not expect some narrow peaks in the two proton, two neutron decay case uh, for, for those systems with uh, small decay energies. But of course, this needs further uh, studies to fully understand this topic. So thank you very much for, the, for your attention. Thank you for the talk. So we are ahead of the schedule. So if, if there are questions, uh, we have time to to take them now. Hans? Yeah, thank you for this very impressive work and talk. So I was wondering if this kind of calculation that you're doing, can that be also done for uh, all the isotopes that decay by beta delay to proton emission? Or is, the, is that too complicated with all the intermediate states? Yes, uh, we, we are trying to study some beta delay to proton emissions. But, uh, but uh, well, there are some challenges because uh, for, uh, usually the excitation energy is too high. And uh, uh, so it's hard for, for uh, simple models to describe those uh, energy levels and uh, structural informations. And uh, another aspect is that the, the, sometimes they have some iso spin forbidden transitions, so which is also a, a challenges for our models to study. But uh, we are working on it, so yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Francois? Yes. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. Can you use the properties of the intermediate nucleus, so one proton less? Uh, to constrain the calculations. Yes. So what is your question? Yeah. Uh, Dean, please. 
Can you hear me? Now, yes. Yes. Now, yes. So my question was, um, can you, you um, can you use the properties of the intermediate nucleus to constrain the calculations? Sometimes the properties are known. For example, in uh, magnesium 19, that decays to uh, to protonless, but in between there is a, a sodium um, 18 that is known. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, usually we, we, we constrain those interactions for the A minus one systems to get a, uh, to get those uh, uh, fine tuning those interactions. And then we calculate those decay mechanisms to see whether it uh, is a sequential decay or two problem decays. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, Dean? So Seaman, um, very nice talk. It's great to see you that you're okay. continuing this, this really nice work. Um, I had a question, uh, looking towards the future, if we were able to measure the spins of the correlated protons, um, mm -hmm. what new information could you see from the, the spin correlation and the entanglement with the orbital angular momentum? Um, yes, that uh, we, we are trying to study some, some entanglement for that. For example, the, in the brain six, we found that uh, uh, mo most of them are uh, those valence protons are found the pairs, and uh, even though they have some amount of uh, large angle emissions. So yeah, if uh, we can measure the spins of, of uh, the, those protons, that uh, we can actually uh, measure those entanglements in, in uh, large angles in this uh, nuclear case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Robert? Uh, Simon, so you were showing um, quite nicely the um, with, with these dinucleon pairs that they couple Thank to um, all these different uh, shell model configurations, the S1 half squared, the P1 half squared, the, sorry, mm -hmm. the P squared and the D squared configurations. And so, so in the, um, the P shell nucleus beryllium six, you got a significant amount of S1 half squared just due to the uh, lower barrier. And of course the SD shell, you got a lot. So what about in the, um, the, the higher shells like the, uh, the PF, are you, are you still gonna get a lot of uh, S1 half squared emission? Mm, my, uh, I, I, we haven't done any research on that. I, I think that might be possible because uh, as we showed that uh, those uh, diaprose structures actually it combines uh, uh, different uh, orbitals, including S waves, no matter it was in FP wave or FP shell or uh, SD shells. So it might have some transitions from the high orbitals to the S waves, but uh, we, we need to study that to confirm it, confirm it. So yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, we pick. Yeah, so thank you. Simon for, for this uh, wonderful talk. I would like to come back to the question by Dean. This is actually a very deep, deep question uh, about the entanglement of the protons, you know, and uh, to what extent we can use this term when talking about two proton or two neutron emission, right? Because it is not really a two body system. You know, we have also a core and core participates in the in the energy and angular momentum conservation, uh, so uh, it would be indeed very nice to carry out calculations, you know, uh, which will probe those spin correlations to see to what extent core right effect can be neglected. Yes, yes right. I totally agree. Olivier? Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, thank you. What do you call strong and uh, weak pairing? You, you, you assume that the pairs are have spin anti-aligned all the time, or uh, can, uh, can you elaborate more on, on is it the distance between the nuclei or the, the, nu the nucleons, or what, what do you do with this? Uh... Yeah, the spin is just uh, calculated by the, by the model itself. What we do is just uh, uh, um, readjusted the strength of the nuclear nuclear interactions and uh, let the models do the rest. So basically, uh, what we mean that uh, 
the strong pattern we will increase 15 percent of the Minnesota injections in, in the two proton injections. Since uh, in, inside the nuclear, there are some uh, nuclear medias. We, we don't actually know what is the strength in, inside the nucleus. So we just uh, simulate those uh, strong parents with uh, different the strengths of the nuclear, nuclear interactions. But uh, may, may, may I ask a question related to this? So when, when you, yeah. because 50% is a very strong modification. So w w when, you, when you modify it, do you, do, do you change something else in the Hamiltonian so that you, you still have beryllium-6 at the right energy or? Yes, yes. We change the single particle, uh, uh, to, to the single particle potentials, which is the Wood-Saxon potentials, to make sure those decay energy remain the same. But just we just want to illustrate the pictures about those yeah, yeah, pairings. Yeah. So we change that a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. OK. Thank you. Can I ask a question about that? OK, yeah, uh, that's right. Do you start with the same wave function in that case? I mean, with a strong pairing or weak pairing, you have the same initial uh, wave function? No, the initial wave function was calculated using our three body models. So when we de define the Hamiltonians, we, we have the eigen corresponding eigen wave functions. And uh, then we calculate those uh, decay dynamics uh, by applying those time evolution operators on, on different uh, wave functions. That means the binding energy is different, no? Uh, we, we adjust uh, those uh, single particle potentials to obtain those same, uh, to get those same in binding energies. So that uh, since the, the, the two problem decay waste is very sensitive to the binding energy, so we will make sure that uh, the decay energy is the same. Okay, so we had already a lot of questions. Maybe uh, you may have still a few more, but we can leave them for the discussion at the end of the session. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Simin, for this very nice talk. And we move to Hans for the exotic decays. We don't hear you. Are you talking? Yeah, we see the, we see the slides, but we don't hear you. Hans? Miguel, you can unmute him because you have host privileges. Ah, OK. Uh, Yeah. Okay. So now I can. Can you see my slide now? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And we can hear you too. Okay. Uh, but I just have to find my slides myself. <laughs> it's uh, lost on my screen. Okay. So now I'm finally there. So yeah. So thank you very much for the uh, nice workshop and the opportunity to participate in it. So I was uh, charged with talking about exotic nuclear decays. Uh, and uh, I, I've sort of uh, looked at the themes of this workshop and, uh, I, and uh, picked up uh, how these themes uh, overlap with uh, what I'm working on. And this is uh, what I will try to cover in this talk. Uh, so we've talked about the uh, clustering, FMO states, three body decays, decays in the continua. Uh, so all of those topics nicely fit into uh, to, uh, the kind of experiments that I'm doing on uh, mainly carbon 12. So that will be the, the theme of today. Of this talk. <clears throat> so, so I start with this overview here of uh, taking from the tunnel evaluation of, uh, of uh, resonances in carbon-12 and this is a, a terrible mess I would say uh, and I feel somewhat responsible because I've contributed to, uh, to some of the, the, the many candidate states that are listed to the right of this slide here. Um, 
So part of the motivation that I have is try to see whether we can uh, clarify this somewhat confusing picture. Uh, what I show here to the left is, is the table that was shown by, by Dean on Monday, which is very repossible, uh, impressive results from, uh, from their lattice uh, type calculations <clears throat> at Benicio. Uh, so there is also, uh, I think, interesting theoretical developments and developments that uh, sort of require that we try to get a, a clearer picture on the experimental side. So um, just to give a, a sort of a very recent example of why this is so complicated, I, I picked up this, uh, this paper here from the archive from the Tempa group where they have measured two types of reactions, alpha, alpha prime and um, carbon 14 PT reaction to populate carbon 12. Uh, in this case, in a very complete uh, experiment, I would say, where you uh, not only measure the scattered proton or triton, um, uh, but also measure the decay alpha particles in this uh, cake array uh, at the target position. So what we see here is a, as a function of excitation energy measured by the scattered particle, you see the uh, decay alpha particles or protons, depending on uh, how the different uh, excited states decay. Uh, and you see uh, uh, how different final states in beryllium 8 or uh, proton plus bond 11 are then populated by these different uh, structures in the continuum. Uh, and then if you try to interpret this type of data in terms of uh, resonances, uh, then you get this kind of complete, complicated picture here where we see uh, alpha, alpha prime data on the top three panels and then PT data on the two lower panels and the uh, and the group here have then made a, a very complicated uh, uh, fit using R matrix uh, to try to elucidate how this continuum can be explained in terms of uh, different resonances, zero plus, two plus, y, one minus, and so on, uh, based on the angular distribution on the scattered particle. Uh, so, uh, and then you see, uh, as um, in this paper, I think the main sort of message is that there's uh, several zero plus uh, components around 9, 10 MeV uh, in carbon 12. Uh, and one, one particular breathing mode uh, corresponding to a, a breathing mode of the oil state. So, but, but I, I'm sure you can appreciate from this plot how complicated it is to actually elucidate uh, or interpret this type of continuum structures in this type of experiments. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, the approach that uh, I have been pursuing for many years is to, to use, uh, instead of uh, this type of reaction, then to use the weak decays uh, and see uh, whether that can give uh, at least a different light on, on this problem. And the, um, what I've indicated with these arrows here to the right is that uh, by using this method, you, you can use the selection rules of this uh, weak decays to to remove some of the states that can then not be populated in the loud transition. So this is uh, um, the basic idea. Uh, so what I'll be doing is to, I'm, I'll, I'll have to, uh, you'll have to bear with me through a little bit of a short uh, historical uh, background for, for some of the experiments we've done before. Then after that, I'll come to uh, new data uh, that uh, we have taken in the last year. Um, so uh, in the next, about five slides you will uh, you will maybe have seen some of it before but then afterward i'll promise you there will be some new stuff uh, so um so the the idea or, or the kind of background basics you need to understand in order to uh, to understand the, uh, the the data that i will be showing you is that when you do this kind of uh, beta decay there is this uh, of course uh, the phase space from the uh, leptons the electron and the neutrino uh, and, and they are strongly energy dependent, of course, uh, and, and they will then be different for the two isotopes that, that we are measuring because of the difference in the Q value. So that the structure that you see in the decays or in the experiments will, will uh, be modified by these different um, energy dependent functions. So the, the physics that we are interested in will be sitting in this matrix element, of course, so that, that you can get by dividing out this uh, known energy dependence from the base space factor. Um, that's probably uh, will help you understand some of the plots that are coming next. So then the historical introduction is uh, in three parts. So we have done uh, various types of experiments trying to, to use this idea 
uh, and I want to show you this because there are some links to some of the things that were mentioned by uh, uh, earlier talks uh, where there are some links to results there. So most of what I'll be talking about here is published in these papers that, uh, that you can find in the slides later on. Uh, so the first type of experiment is isol beams, low energy beams that you uh, shoot into this uh, foil here and then just wait for the decay to happen. Uh, this has the advantage that you can measure the individual energies and you can get very uh, good data because it's uh, you don't have a, a scattered beam so uh, you have high resolution of the detected particles in the uh, in the detectors uh, so um, so i want to show you this plot here uh, which shows you the uh, triple coincidence data where on this x-axis you have the total energy corresponding to different final states in the daughter carbon 12 and then up here you see the individual energies and you see then the decay uh, correlations in the continuum uh, when these decays are happening for different states as a function of energy here. So what I want to focus on is, is this part in here that that's what I'll be fo focusing on in the new experiment that we've taken. So this this uh, in, in the middle here is what would be uh, for the Hoyle state called non-sequential decay. So these are decays that are not going through the ground state of polymate but rather uh, either through the excited state in uh, in Brulimate, the two plus state, or or let's say some kind of direct mechanism. So in the previous experiments where we have been doing this, the statistics in this branch, although it's not zero, it's not very high. So so uh, we can see the case when we move away from the Hoyle state, which is sitting down here at 7.6. We do see the case that do not decay via the ground state rate. So we want to understand what can we learn for those decays and we do not have enough statistics from the existing data to actually do that so that's the message i want to you to take away from this plot here then we have also uh, and this is the second part of the historical introduction done another type of experiment where we do inverse kinematics uh, and produce these isotopes at four to five mv per nucleon and then uh, shoot them into a detector you have it over here it's a little double-sided silicon strip detector um, where we can then measure the decay inside the detector and measure the full energy of the decay uh, with high efficiency and also down to very low energy. And this is uh, also uh, a plot you may have seen before, but the advantage of this method is that you can then measure the, the all the way down to the particle threshold where the Hoyle tail is sitting, basically, a few hundred kV above. And um, so uh, by combining these two experiments, we have access to the full spectrum and also to down to some energy around here, the correlation of how the uh, particles are emitted. I want to show you this because it has a relation to the, the talk by Grisha on Monday, where he talked about this uh, idea of whether there is a, an FM of state around the Hoyle state. So uh, I was wondering whether we could actually use this data to, uh, to uh, improve on his his uh, limit because uh, we have much more events here than here. I think he had about 20,000 events in, in his uh, active target. Although we have many more events, uh, unfortunately, the, what you see down here is where this uh, FMOF state is supposed to be, according to uh, these people. Uh, we have the beta, so we cannot, unfortunately, improve the limit from, from this data. Then the final part of the historical introduction is that we uh, we also did an experiment trying to look for the gamma decay of the um, oil state. And that is um, actually the motivation why we did that. This was done at Argonne National Lab using gamma sphere. Uh, the idea was that uh, when we measured the, uh, the branching ratio populating the oil state and compared it to earlier measurements, and that was the same both for the decay of boron 12 and nitrogen 12. The value that we got was about 50% smaller than previous measurements going back to the 1970s by Wilkinson and Wapperton and, and people like that. So we were a little bit worried that uh, something could be wrong. So therefore we wanted to measure this branching ratio in, in a completely independent way. And uh, we did that using the what we then thought was the known gamma decay branching ratio of about four times 10 to the minus four and and then uh, um, normalizing that to the known branching ratio to the first excited two plus state and what you see here is the data where we have the the four mv the two plus state the first excited two plus state and then over here in coincidence with gamma sphere the gamma decay from the whole state to that two plus state uh, and we also measured the angular correlation between those two gamma rays and it has the expected uh, shape uh, for, for this cascade. 
Uh, so now this, this experiment has uh, somehow got a relevance uh, due to, oh, let me, sorry, let me just first mention this FEMOV state. This was shown already on Monday by Grisha that uh, if this uh, supposed FMO state would gamma decay, it should sit somewhere around here in the spectrum. So one can also use this data as was indeed done by Bishop uh, to uh, exclude that possibility. Uh, but the other thing we can use this data to now is to comment on this uh, new result that came out of the Oslo group um, uh, with, uh, I think the experiment was uh, led by Tibor Kibeti. Uh, where they uh, have measured the gamma decay of the Hoyle state uh, again using a PP prime reaction and, and then found that the, uh, the, this number here should in fact be six times 10 to the minus four instead of four times 10 to the minus four, which is a very large uh, change, uh, which would have uh, some, uh, some consequences for astrophysics. And uh, it's somewhat surprising because there's a, a whole chain of experiments, I think, of the order of 10, uh, getting numbers around this uh, four times 10 to the minus four. So if one turns the argument around now and uh, believes that the measurement of the branching ratio that we have done uh, previously is correct, and then uses this uh, measurement here from Argon National Lab, then our uh, experiment confirms the old value, in fact. So uh, of course, I would uh, tend to say that this uh, Oslo measurement must somehow be uh, in need of correction. Uh, so the, the final part of my little uh, bracket here of historical introduction concerns how did we then interpret this data in terms of uh, resonances. And this is part of what was written in this table that I started with from the evaluation in, in tunnel. Uh, so some of those values are coming from this estimate here. So what we see here is uh, on the top, the data from uh, both the implantation type experiment and from the uh, old ISOL type experiment. Uh, split into two channels, the, uh, the part of the data that goes to the ground state of brilliant made and the ones that goes not to the ground state, I prefer to say. This is these error bars here with uh, rather or these points with large error bars. And then we tried to make a, a multi-channel, multi-level R matrix fit to this data. And we got this, uh, this um, at least um, two sort of more or less degenerate a zero plus state and two plus state with very similar properties around 11, 11 MeV. Um, so that's kind of the status of the, uh, before we started looking at this again. Um, uh, so what, what is all the rest? Uh, when we try to do this fit, we also, we get, uh, there has to be a contribution from this kind of background poles in the R matrix fit. And uh, it's somewhat an open discussion. What is, how should that really be interpreted? And maybe that's something we can talk about in the, in the later discussion, whether that is somehow direct to continuum or what it is. Um, so let me then turn to, uh, to our new experiments. And I put this Apollo 13 logo on here to, uh, to illustrate how it feels like to have done this experiment because it's, it's actually, we did the first part of the experiment already in 2014, but then the cyclotron broke uh, it was a, a gift, or not a gift, it was a, a payment of a loan from the old Soviet Union to Finland. To, to They got this uh, cyclotron, and uh, we were the first user, and then it broke within one day. Uh, and then we were waiting for the repair, and we finally got the beam time, and we were supposed to be scheduled in, in the spring of 2020. And you can then imagine what happened. Uh, so uh, we, uh, due to the corona, we could not uh, take the beam time. But then, due to the dip in uh, in um, cases in around August uh, last year, we, we managed to get uh, two people up there, my two uh, my PhD student and and another PhD student, uh, and they alone together with the IGSOL team completed then the experiment. It's completely. Uh, I was, uh, was <laughs> I'm quite impressed that they managed to travel up there with all the stuff and do the experiment. And, and, and do it successfully. So that is what I'll be showing you today, the result of that effort. Uh, so um, this is a picture of the setup. So it's a typical kind of box. There's also a lid to this box, the beam coming in uh, into the setup and then uh, and stopping in the middle here and then surrounded by six double silo silicon detectors. Uh, so so this is now the, uh, the data that came out of that. Uh, and, and you see now, uh, it's hard to see from this type of plot, but now we have a lot more statistics in this region in between that we are interested in, in particular. Uh, these kind of uh, 
decays that do not go uh, to the grounds that are really made. So we have about, uh, I would say, roughly speaking, about a factor of 20 more statistics in both of the isotopes, boron-12 and nitrogen-12. That's a lot more statistics. So here, by, by just doing the invariant mass, we can, of course, separate away the, 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 the decays that go to the ground that are really made. So we have a pretty nice uh, handle on, on this uh, these decays that uh, are more exotic, shall we say. Um, and, and we can do the same then for boron-12, uh, the, the mirror. And uh, again, we can also look at the uh, selectively at the in, at the, um, the case of interest. So um, let me then give you some first kind of results from these two, uh, these new data. So the first kind of thing we always want to do is to look for consistency. And so this plot here is a little bit complicated. So this is uh, referring to what I was talking about in the beginning with this uh, F factor, the phase space of the electron and the neutrino. So what we've done here is to divide by that phase space factor and also divide by the half-life, which is different for the two decays, of course, boron-12 and nitrogen-12. And then you, what you then get uh, if you divide that up to the branching ratio is something that is uh, related to the matrix element square. So that should in fact be the same uh, for the two decays. And, and therefore you can then put them on the same plot. And you can also put them on the same plot as uh, previous measurements. So what we have in blue and red are the new data here. For the blue is a uh, boron 12, which should be compared to uh, the gray, if you can see that. So they, they kind of overlap, stop around the Q value here. And the same when if you compare the red and the um, and the green, which are then the nitrogen twelve uh, from KVI uh, two thousand six, and then the new nitrogen twelve from uh, from Finland XL. and they also compare. And when you divide out by that F factor, you see that this uh, events that we see at high energy close to the uh, end of the beta decay window in in strength are increasing a lot. So, uh, so the, the actual beta strength, uh, although it looks low in branching ratio, is, is increasing in this peculiar way as you, as you approach the, um, the end of the beta decay window. So that's one kind of thing. So uh, our data is uh, consistent uh, with previous measurements and it's consistent between the two decays. And now we have uh, much better statistics on the decays that are not going to the ground that are really made. So the, what this plot here shows is the same as the previous one, but now selected only for those decays that do not go to the ground that are really made. So this is a, a, a two plus in really made or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that's part of the analysis to find out what that is. So again, we then by dividing out this F factor and by the half-life, we, uh, we um, put this data in a form that should be comparable for the two decays of the two new isotopes. So, um, <clears throat> and as you could see, uh, the, those two distributions after those corrections are indeed consistent with each other where they should be. Of course, the blue curve does not uh, extend to high energy because the, the Q value is lower in, in the decay of boron 12. Uh, but, but so this, this, uh, this curve here is then, uh, believable and uh, is the physics we want to understand how that, why that looks like it does. And then I want to show you this plot here, which is uh, because it relates a little bit to what uh, Bob Charity was talking about yesterday. And it's also uh, relates to how we should understand these kind of distributions that I will be showing you. So this is uh, more or less the, the birth of this idea of democratic decay that came out of the, Kosh the Koshatov Institute where they were analyzing these systems that we are talking about now, uh, Brillium 6, uh, Neon 16, and so on, in terms of this expansion in harmonic or in hyperspherical harmonic functions. And then uh, they, they termed those decays that could be described by only the lowest hyperspherical harmonics as democratic decays. And he published this paper in about 1990, uh, where he mentioned that one should look at these cases, carbon 12, 1 plus, Neon 16, 0 plus. And uh, he, he claims that the results obtained in his own paper uh, on the expected decay properties of these states indicate that the corresponding experiment should be carried out. <laughs> so indeed, uh, that has been done now. So for the case of carbon 12, he, uh, for the one plus state, 
he, he put this, he had this figure here in the paper that uh, I saw more well, five years later when I was a PhD student and said that could be very interesting to measure. So that was the motivation for, for what we did here. So what, what this, um, what this is uh, coming from is indeed the uh, the narrow one plus state that you were seeing in some of the earlier plots uh, uh, that uh, when it decays you can you get this kind of a uh, distribution in a Dalit plot so you have this very funny six fold uh, flower type thing uh, that indeed looks like uh, uh, predicted by this uh, hyperspherical harmonics uh, expansion or the lowest one in that expansion. So um, uh, what we did in this paper here was try to find out what is then the best description. Uh, this is an old paper, but I think it's worth mentioned about in this workshop because uh, the discussion has been touched upon a little bit. Uh, so, so we tried to, uh, to describe it both in this kind of uh, hyperspherical harmonics type picture and also in an R matrix picture. And uh, the best description we got at that time was the R matrix picture that uh, takes into account the uh, the properties of the, the really made two plus state. And then you can ask, does that mean then that this is a sequential decay or does it mean that it's a direct decay? And I think uh, as far as I understood the previous talk, I think it's maybe not the right type of question, but it's, it's more a question one should ask, what is the role of the interaction in, in this decay? And, and, and uh, what one should conclude from the fact that the, the lowest hyperspherical harmonics uh, does not give a complete picture is simply that uh, there are also effects of the interaction. But I would not say that that means then that it's a sequential decay. I don't, I don't think it's a very meaningful um, distinction. So we, we tried to, I think in the same spirit as the previous talk to, to sort of follow up on these ideas in these papers down here, I will not go into any detail, but it's the same kind of philosophy where we try to use uh, a model, in this case, only uh, a cluster model, three alpha model, um, to, uh, to calculate the, in, a, in a way that took into account interactions, what these uh, Dalis plots should look like and what might be then relation to the structure of the, the internal structure of these states. Of course, that kind of thing only makes sense for states that can have a cluster structure. So this one plus state is not a very good example for that. Because it's a, it has a very it's a very narrow state with little cluster structure. Um, so so now with this new data that we have in hand, we can try to make these kind of plots not only for that strongly populated one plus state, but also for the other structures that we have populated in these two decays. So what I show you here is for the Boron twelve case, uh, Dali's plots uh, produced from different energy intervals as indicated here. So this is the lowest energy interval and going up here to, this is the energy interval where this one plus state that I just talked about is sitting. So you can recognize here the same six fold uh, structure that uh, that was uh, seen in the previous slide. So the reason this is, this is from Boron 12. So there this state is extremely weakly populated about 10 to the minus six. Uh, but you see that as we move away from that state, this, this Dalit structure changes its, uh, its appearance so what we can do in order to uh, to get a more clear picture is to uh, use the six-fold symmetry and fold it into uh, one-sixth of the Dalis plot. And then you get these kind of cakes here. And then, uh, of course, you get more intensity in each, uh, in each uh, segment here. So this is the same data just folded into so that you order the, uh, the particles after their energy into this uh, reduced plot here. But still, you can see, of course, that the, the nature of this uh, distribution changes as a function of energy. And then we can do the same for, uh, for the mirror nucleus. And, and there we have more statistics. Uh, you see that in particular for the, for the one plus state up here that I was mentioning before, uh, but also for the other plots. Uh, of course, now you, you want to see if the Dalis plots distribution that you see in the two mirrored case, are they consistent with each other? And, and that is uh, mostly the case, but not always. There are some cases where we uh, see some differences, but uh, uh, we are still working on this. Uh, this may be just an artifact of the um, uh, acceptance of the different detector setups used in the two experiments. Uh, you can also see as you move these two plots down here are for the high energy part um, above the one plus state. So this is a, uh, um, 
six to seven and seven to eight MeV, if I'm not totally wrong. Uh, so the, the highest energy window in populated in decay. And you see that the structure of these clots are quite different from the ones below. So here the intensity seems to be in the middle of the Dallas plot. Um, so then another thing we've been talking about in this uh, in this workshop is this uh, phenomenon on the ghost and how should that be, uh, how does that in, uh, influence the discussion on the decay of the Hoyle state that was discussed uh, yesterday and also Monday, I think. So uh, this is just to illustrate what that is, what is that ghost? Uh, so this is uh, just, if you take one of these one level R matrix uh, descriptions here uh, and then just change the energy. So change the energy here of a one level uh, and see how what is the profile coming out of such a one level R matrix expression. Then uh, if, if we move down in energy, we start from, from this one here, it looks asymmetric peak, but then it becomes more and more narrow, of course, as you get closer to the, uh, as the decay energy becomes smaller. But then as you are very close to the threshold, you see this peak is very narrow, but then it develops a secondary peak here, which is then what we call the ghost. Uh, so, so that means that if, if you have a, a uh, then a decay and you see something that is not sitting in this peak, and uh, then you should be careful what you mean by calling that a direct decay. Maybe it's just the feature of this tail of the narrow uh, resonance that you are seeing in your three body decay. So, so uh, maybe to uh, see whether that may play a role. So this plot here is um, uh, the um, branching ratio for decays to let's say excited state and bullimate divided by the, the total branching ratio as a function of excitation energy. So, uh, so the branching ratio to the ground state plus the branching ratio to excited state and bullimate uh, that's the in the denominator and then the numerator we get the only the part going to the excited state. So it's a the fraction that uh, is uh, not sequential if you want to keep to that language. So um, you see that that starts out low as, as is clear because of the the barrier um, and then it grows in some way. Uh, if you go up to this, so this peak here, this is the one plus state, which can only decay, it cannot decay to the ground state. So that, that here this uh, value comes up to one. Uh, so, uh, so we talked a little bit about that. Let, maybe I start with that. When we talked about um, Grisha's results from the Hoyle state, where he got a value about one times 10 to the four uh, branching ratio for non-sequential um, decay. Uh, so, so that would be corresponding to continuing this curve down to the Hoyle state and, and asking the question, what fraction of the Hoyle state has uh, excited state uh, decay compared to the total? And then you would get 10 to the minus four down here somewhere. Uh, so, so these curves down here uh, are uh, using plots of the nature that I showed before here, just trying to integrate what is the fraction in the ghost compared to the fraction in the peak as a function of energy when you take into account the, uh, the penetrability in the first emission as well. And, and then uh, this is the fraction then you would expect in the ghost compared to the, to the total. And this is for zero plus state and this is for two plus state as a function of energy. And then what we can try to do, compare this uh, calculation or estimate with, uh, with the data here. So for example, if you look at uh, an energy of three MeV, you see the data says something about 15% going to the excited state. And, and if you go down here, you see for zero plus state, it's also around 15%. So the fraction that we measure, let's say up to about three MeV is consistent with the fraction that you would expect from this effect of the ghost in Brulimate. But then you see above three MeV, there seems to be kind of a kick or a kink, whatever you want to call it uh, in this uh, fraction. And this is about the same energy where the, um, the two plus state in Brulimate is sitting where the centroid of that, it has a width of course, but the center of that state is, is sitting around that energy. So maybe that increase in, fra in fraction is, is a meaning that here we're going from a uh, dominantly ghost type contribution to a dominantly Willamette two plus type contribution. Over here, we tried to do that, uh, estimate a little bit better than uh, this uh, more simple calculation here by using different estimations of the final state Coulomb interaction between the, uh, the three alpha particles. Uh, and, and, and the branching ratios down here 
uh, are sort of in the ballpark of the measurement provided by Grisha's experiment with the Texas uh, active target about the 10 to the minus four level. So my, my interpretation would be that what he's seeing uh, might be uh, coming from, from that type of uh, explanation over here. Um, so we are of course now heavily engaged in trying to interpret this data um, but to see how should we, um, how can we understand these combined results that Dali's plots as a function of energy and the energy distribution of the of the um, intensity of those Dalit plots, and we uh, we are doing using the the only tool we have this uh, multi-level uh, multi-channel R matrix fits, and uh, we are this is still in progress. Uh, and uh, what I can say at this point is that we 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 seem to confirm the existence of these uh, states around 11, 11 MeV, particularly for the two plus case. Um, and then it seems to be that we need to have uh, uh, certainly also more zero plus than, than the Hoyle state, uh, which is, uh, uh, so but, but how that should be distributed is not so clear. And it seems to be that we need to have a lot of uh, this, uh, what is in our matrix called a background pole uh, that, uh, that seems to have a very large strength relative to, uh, to resonances sitting in the actual energy area where we're looking. So, um, this is unfortunately uh, very much work in progress, so I cannot give any final conclusions at this point on this. So I don't know how much time is it I have left. Probably five minutes. Five minutes. So, um, so the last thing I wanted to briefly mention is that uh, so we've been trying to pursue another idea as well, in order to um, to use the same kind of idea, but to then get access to other states that you cannot populate in these beta decays due to selection rules. So the idea here simply is to uh, uh, to look at higher energy in couple so there's a series of uh, narrow or relatively narrow isospin one states that you can populate easily in uh, in proton induced reactions on Born 11. And then the idea is, okay, let's let's populate such a state and then let's see whether it gamma decays down to this continuum. And then by selecting states with different spins and parities, we then get selectivity towards different final states. For example, if we populate a three minus state, you would say, okay, then I may be able to study four plus states and four minus states that I cannot study in beta decay. Uh, so, so that's the idea. Um, it's, it's turned out rather difficult, but let me show you what, uh, what we have got out of this idea. So the first idea or the first place we, we could use this idea was a uh, very low energy resonance, 165 kV protons on Born 11, then you populate this uh, two plus uh, isospin one state. That's the, uh, the mirror of the first excited state in nitrogen 12 in Born 11. And, uh, and then we looked for what do you populate uh, in, in gamma decays from that state down to the continuum. And the idea is not to measure this gamma ray but to measure then the particles emitted when they are, when the final states are, are populated by this intermediate gamma ray, gamma decay. So the detectors that we are using here are again silicon detectors. So the, the experiment is a beam of protons coming in, hitting a born 11 target, very thin, uh, and then measuring the, the emitted uh, three alpha particles and then using energy conservation to uh, identify cases where there was a missing energy from an intermediate gamma ray. Uh, so the first plot here is from that first case. Um, and this is published already in 2016. Uh, but so you see that the, the, the data that you get out of that is uh, more or less looking the same as uh, it looks when you uh, measure the beta decay. Uh, so over here to the right, you have the direct emitted alpha particle from the direct decay of this two plus. Day. That is not what we are interested in. So we are interested in those events where the total energy is lower than the initial state. So you see the statistics is, uh, is, is less, so uh, it's, it's not so easy to say something, but you can say something. I mean, you, you uh, first of all, we measure the known states, three minus state, one minus state, uh, one plus state, uh, and uh, we can then extract uh, BM1, BE1 values, and they can be found in, in this paper. And then we also see strengths uh, at places where there are uh, not at least clear identified uh, resonances in 
in the evaluations, for example, here. So, so the, these states correspond to these events up here. And we can see that since they have events on this branch here, they are natural parity states, and also in this region here. And so, uh, if if you uh, have a model at home uh, trying to uh, to calculate this uh, part of uh, carbon twelve spectrum, now you at least can try to see whether your model can can uh, be consistent with those measured BM ones or BE one values. And the same game we have played in two other cases. So uh, this was published last year. Uh, in this case, we used two MV protons to populate a zero plus C equal to one state. And then we got this uh, data here. So in this case, you, you mainly populate this one plus state that I've been talking about. Uh, but you also see other things, the one minus state here. And, uh, and again, you see the three minus is probably due to the tail of another resonance. And then there's some other strengths here that uh, unfortunately is hard to um, identify at this level of statistics. So this is actually an experiment that ran a week. So it's not so easy to uh, to get uh, 10 times more statistics if you uh, if you were to suggest that. Uh, and in the same experiment, we uh, we also measured the three minus state a little bit higher, 2.6 MV beam incident on the target, and uh, and then you uh, you get this data. So. Uh, this is just to uh, to illustrate that it is possible to get a similar type of data from this idea, but it's uh, unless somebody comes up with a better idea of how to detect this, it's probably not a, a very uh, uh, fruitful avenue to continue along. So I think my uh, my last slide. This is just uh, to uh, to look a little bit into the future. So what, I, what I'm hoping to, uh, to spend some time uh, on in the future is to try to look at uh, this region here. So this is beta late uh, proton or two proton emission region that uh, I think is now finally becoming available at EFRIP. So some of the, the yield estimates that are coming uh, from there are looking really, really, really impressive, I think. So, so you're, you're, you're getting these isotopes now in the hundreds or thousands which would uh, permit to get the same level of statistics for beta delayed two proton emission as, uh, as, as I've shown here for, for these beta delayed three alpha events uh, from, from nitrogen 12 and boron 12. So I think that could potentially uh, be uh, an interesting development. And if it can be compared to the type of calculations that we heard in the previous talk, I think that's an interesting um, future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hans, so yeah, the, we uh, we have the break right now, but maybe we can take one or two questions. If Martin, my hands, um, lovely. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Um, so, so you're right. There's still a lot of confusion in carbon twelve, isn't there? Um, and you were very careful around, you know, the, the additional two plus, which has been identified in you know, in other reaction channels. So, well, let's call it nine point five MeV or something like that. Mm -hmm. you, you you don't include it in your analysis at all. Um, but, uh, you mean put it in and fix it or something like that? Or? All right, I can turn it around. It doesn't emerge from your analysis. <laughs> but I, I, my interpretation is it, it, we are seeing the same as that in in our data. I think I, I don't think that too. If that's your question, I think I think somehow the 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 two plus strengths that are seen in those experiments that you refer to and what we are seeing that must be the same. So uh, so but, it's, uh, but you you place it higher in energy, eleven ish MeV. Yeah. As I mean, how does one reconcile that? Yeah, that that that's a good question. But I think I, I think it may be a little premature to take to take that discussion at this point. That's why I say it's still a work in progress, because it's. Uh, I mean, we have this uh, other con this zero plus contribution, which is uh, making it difficult to uh, to disentangle because they look so much the same. So um, what we're hoping is that those Dalitz distributions would add additional selectivity. Or sensitivity or difference between those two uh, uh, states or uh, types of structure, whatever you want to call it, that 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 uh, that this will become more clear because uh, 
yeah, that, that that's at least my uh, my expectation or hope or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so at least I, I do not think that that we are seeing uh, different states in different experiments somehow. I think it must be the same. So I'm also looking forward to the uh, the, the you know the, uh, the the Higgs states of being extended to higher energy to see how how does that. I think that might also clarify the the picture a little bit. Uh, so. Yeah, I think it's uh, just a s slow, long march to <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to clarity. I'm sure it will it will all con converge at some point. <laughs> okay, I I don't see other hands, uh, but of course we have a discussion at the end of the session, and I think we will be able to come back to to hands talk. Uh, so thank you, Hans and Simin, for your talks. And now we have a break. <laughs>